Hello and welcome everyone to Voice of Palestine. Uh, we're back after a while and we're back actually with a couple of uh, great people. But of course, uh, as always, this is me, Yazan, your co-host for Voices of Palestine. We're bringing you uh, some of the voices directly from Gaza to share the experience and their uh, their views on what's happening in Palestine and specifically in Gaza right now to shed some light on the atrocities as well as what's happening, plus what people are hoping for, of course, in the uh, during this genocide in addition to how people are able to survive and get through throughout this genocide. And of course, uh, with me here, we have our co-host Fatim, who's gonna uh, be supporting us throughout this uh, session as always with our two of the greatest guests from Gaza, uh, Nadira and Ibrahim. Of course, but to get started, um, Nadir and Ibrahim, they're both Gazans and it has been a while since I've been trying to get them onto our uh, show. To be honest, uh, for, uh, since October twenty twenty three, so <laughs> it has been an actual, it has been a tough experience to even make sure that our Gazan uh, friends and family members are able to stay safe and join us to share uh, their stories and share what's happening with them. So. Uh, maybe I would like to kick it off with Fat for now, just to uh, get started, and of course, uh, with our two great uh, great guests here. So, Fat for now. Thank you so much for that introduction, Yazan. So my name is Fatin. As many of you know, I'm a Palestinian. Uh, we've missed all of you. We're very excited to kick off web webcast six with these two incredible featured voices. Um, Ibrahim and Nadir, I, I can tell you as a Palestinian, you know, with family in occupied Palestine in the West Bank, watching the genocide through our phone screens has been horrific. I mean, there's no, there really are no words. And so I'm like in awe to be in front of both of you because, you know, you didn't get to watch it. You, you actually experienced it. And so I can't, you know, I can't even imagine being in your shoes. I just have... So, so much respect and admiration for both of you. I find you both so inspiring and incredible. And we are so honored to have you on Voices of Palestine. To begin, I'm gonna begin with um, Nadir. You can just tell me a little bit about yourself and just however you wanna begin, just a little, and, and what you've been through about your family, maybe how they ended up in, you know, in Gaza, whatever you're comfortable sharing with us. Sure, Fred, and thank you so much. Thank you, Fred, thank you, and, and, and I really appreciate your effort to just spread the voices of Palestine and tell the truth for, for everyone across across the world. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Nadir Jorf. I'm from Gaza, Palestine. Um, I've been working in, in the last seven years supporting uh, entrepreneurs and startups across Palestine, MENA region, and, and, and Europe. And for the past uh, four and a half years, I was working with Startups Without Borders, which, in our, which is an organization that supports migrant and refugees on entrepreneurs across the world. And basically now I'm, I'm, I'm one of those refugees. Um, I've, been in, 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 I've been living in Gaza since I've been born and lived and raised in, in, in Gaza with my whole family and then sisters. And uh, yeah, we, we've been displaced since the first day of the genocidal war. In the 7th of October, as we are living in, in the eastern part of Khan Yunus near the border, which is relatively a dangerous area. Um, yeah, and then we got in, in a very severe circumstances where we got displaced like nine times, uh, sleeping in streets, plastic tents, between rubbish, warehouses, and a lot of sort of like inhumane places, and got through a lot of very dangerous situations where we could explain more further. Um, yeah, having a lot of diseases, illness, hepatitis, some skin disease, uh, having a lot of days without finding food or treatment and being so close to death. And um, maybe I could you know, wrap up in, in, in this way. And just as a follow-up now that your family originally how did they end up in Gaza? 
So my my father and his all of his ancestors was from from Gaza, in 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 Khan Yunis. and my mother is from Yaffa. So my uh, the father my my grand uh, mother father he, he was in in, in Yaffa. when I went to Yaffa, I, I I saw his home, but yeah it was with with another Israeli guard at this moment and uh, yeah then they were displaced in Anakba to uh, to Gaza and uh, yeah they've living in, uh, in in Gaza since that time so yeah my father is 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 from uh, Gaza and. My mother is from Yaffa. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Nadir, for sharing. And, and Ibrahim, same thing. Um, you can tell us a little, a little bit about yourself, a little bit about what you've been through. I, you know, I always like, like we always like to ask um, in terms of your family, are they originally from Gaza? Did they end up in Gaza after the Nakba? Just a little bit about yourself and what you've been through. Um, okay, I'm Ibrahim Atallah. I guess I'm still in Gaza, 20 years old. Um, I graduated from GTC Unruh College uh, as a software developer. I have been working from last year as a .NET software developer and also volunteering from since I was um, 16 years old with the community to help our community to be helpful for our community. Um, my grandfather is from Al-Naqab in Palestine. After Al-Naqba, my grandfather uh got refugees and now he's in Gaza and my mother also uh, my grandmother also refugee from Yibna camp uh so basically I am a refugee um situation in Gaza is so bad uh I am still in Gaza as you know uh we have been displaced we got displaced many times at least six times last time when they invaded my uh, my camp my Gaza camp I live in the middle area of Gaza Strip. Uh, we live many days uh, in a tent in the streets, uh, suffering even to build a tent, uh, suffering to get a food or water. And also we still suffer, suffering from getting a food or a water even to drink or to use. Uh, the medicine and food and all aid in Gaza, uh, the occupation denied. Many yes, and still deny many aid trucks from Inter Gaza, and I I saw many videos from the other side in Rafah crossing in the Egypt side. There are hundreds of aid trucks in Gaza, stuck in Egypt, while there is a famine still in Gaza. So that's all. Thank you so much. Here we. Oh, thank you, Ibrahim, and thank you, Nader. Um. So Ibrahim, uh, as I understand, you're still in Gaza, and uh, yes. after, I believe you were able to uh, leave Gaza. Um, actually, I was about to evacuate from Gaza, but when they start the Rafah operation, as you know, they invade also Rafah crossing, and no one can leave or enter Gaza. Um, hey Ibrahim, so can you tell me how people actually manage? to uh, like cross the border or uh, escape? Um, to evacuate from Gaza to Egypt, you have to pay at least $5,000 so they can put your name on the list to evacuate. And as you know, uh, today is about 10 months of, uh, of the genocide. And people, of course, they don't have enough money to evacuate. So there's Many people dream of evacuate, but they don't have the chance or ability to evacuate. Right, but here, so, and especially when it comes to like families, I, I believe they would have to pay a fortune to even have the opportunity to uh, escape from this war, this genocide, which I don't believe everyone can even afford this. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but Nader, since um, you managed to go to Egypt, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your experience going through the uh, uh, this process? And at, at the moment, right now, do you feel safe? 
or do you still feel for those who are still stuck in Gaza? Yeah, so the decision was was very, 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 very hard. Actually, we, we were super excited just to escape this genocide and the severe circumstances. And we were living in, in, in Rafah. It was really, really bad. And we got a lot of disease and we were really super ex exhausted. And then with, with the support of my friend, I, I created a crowdfunding campaign and then I could uh, manage to have fun with like also selling all of my mother gold just to have that money as Ibrahim said just so we could uh, travel to Egypt but then at, at the same day of a travel it was really hard like we we almost get back uh, and, and take a step back on, on, on this decision look how we could just leave our land our home all people all of our family and, and, and relatives and it was very emotional moment like the most emotional moment in my life just leaving Gaza after leaving six months, seven months in, in, in all of this war and genocide and sharing all of this pain with, with my families and, and relatives. And then it's time to leave. And yeah, we just take that step. And then we were just shocked by more of an obstacles we are facing with all Palestinians here. One of them is that you are continuously afraid of all your relatives and, and friends there in, in, in Gaza. And now I can, I, I can feel that. And really, uh, at the first three months here in, in Egypt, I really wish that I, I, I didn't uh, get, out, uh, get out of Gaza. It's way more comfortable to be in the genocide than being outside it and just being terrified of all your beloved ones. Um, yeah, Palestinians here in Egypt are facing so many issues, especially with the residency, there is no permit to work. Um, most of the countries are closing their visa in our faces. So yeah, basically you're stuck in Egypt and you basically like, you don't have a place to go. Uh, so, and you don't have a permit to work. You, do, you don't have an official re residency. You don't have an official recognition as a refugee either from the government or the UNHCR. So, uh, you don't know how to continue your education, how to continue your life. You don't have any choice to do, you know. So uh, it's 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 very hard for all Palestinians here. Everyone is, is in the groups asking, trying to find solutions or anything just to find a way what we should do. But it's more of an official level and more of a governmental level that no one can on, on, on the individual levels could act in, in, in order influence this. Um, that's an interesting way to put it. Uh, that is, and here, uh, you have talked about the struggles of even leaving Gaza, as well as the struggles that you're facing right now. So even though uh, you're far from, let's say, the genocide itself, but you're still feeling feeling a little bit of uh, fear for the people who are still in Gaza. And because of that, maybe I would say, let's check with Ibrahim, just to tell us what's happening right now and how he's feeling. So maybe uh, we're able to connect the experience of someone who has been able to uh, uh, escape genocide and someone who is still trying to. Um, can you please let us know a little bit about how you feel, Ibrahim? Um, living in Gaza uh, make you always be unsafe. Um, hope to find hope this this genocide to stop. Hope for uh, immediate cease fire. Uh, many nights, many days, all all of your time just thinking about how to get food, how to get water to your family, to your brothers, your sisters, even if you have a family. And with your brothers and sisters, this will make it harder and difficult to you. And living in Gaza, I actually I because I because I entered this uh, this interview, I read a story from Gaza. There is a, a mother whose brother her brother uh, got martyr was martyred by Israeli occupation in the north when they are trying to get a flower, 
and today the cost of a flower bag about two two shekels uh, about one dollar uh just imagine that your your brother is trying and to to get a food to you and your family and then he killed by the Israeli occupation and thinking that the the flower today is ex more expensive that the human life in Gaza is you can't understand this idea so there is a real famine in Gaza in the north and south uh you you don't feel safe you you hope one day and as soon as possible as possible the ceasefire to start um especially when it comes to the value of a human life if just like one dollar or two dollars that's that's really what it costs for a person to lose their life then i don't know what to say but especially when it comes to your family then we we have to pay the price i just want to i it just struck me, um, Ibrahim, what you just said, and I even wrote it down. Flour has become more expensive than human life. And that's that's what you said, right? I mean, I... Yes. Again, we'll, we'll never forget, like, there are no words. And this is why those who continue to remain silent in the face of this horrific again, like no words to describe how awful the, and, and all the various ways in which the Israeli occupation force, forces are attacking and murdering our people. Um, I can't help but think that if we fast forward to 20 years from now, just the, 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 the utter shame that people are gonna feel for not speaking up, that this is the situation we're in right now, that flower, what you said, has become more expensive than human life. I'm so sorry. Can I ask a follow-up question, Ibrahim? And you know, maybe this is for you, Nadir. You know, when you think of Palestinian men in general, um, I mean, everyone is is vulnerable, right? The elderly, women, children. We see that, but especially men. Like, I'm just very curious to get your perspective because I always think about that. You know, I think about my dad and I think about my brothers and I keep thinking how afraid I would feel if they were in Gaza right now, just because men tend to be targeted and you're both very young. I was wondering if you'd, if you'd be comfortable sharing just how does that feel and then how does one keep safe? Um. Actually, it's, it's it's a very hard feeling. I'm I'm the 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 elder son for 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 my family, so I'm, I'm basically take most of the responsibility. Of, uh, and and decisions, and it's it's very hard. I don't know where to go, especially when we are when we were forced to be displaced. Um, I don't know where to go. What is the safe word? like? What is a safe place? And uh, where should we go? It's a very hard situation because yeah, you have five family members in, uh, who are walking just behind you and you don't have that trusted choices to save them. And you have all of these responsibilities, just waking up from the dawn and looking for food, which is my, that was my daily task or my daily challenge just to find something to eat. And in, in some days in Rafa, I couldn't find them. And some days in Khanus, actually, I couldn't find them when we were in that situation. And it was really terrifying. Like, a lot of near bombings happening, a lot of really, very danger, dangerous situations happening. You don't know where to go, how to secure food, how to secure treatment. Like, my, my sister got hepatitis. And... Uh, her eyes turned to yellow and know how what should we do there is no hospital the, the, there is no treatment in the pharmacies and i'm basically almost there is no internet just to say what should i do for her in, in in that situation and the me personally i got super ill and i got some uh chronic diseases and i don't know how to to deal with that but there is no um, medications and especially at that moment when I was super tired, but you are tired, but you have a family that you need to, you need to support them to survive. It's not, it's, it's not just about 
basic needs, it's more of a life or death. So yeah, it's 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 very hard that responsibility. You need just to work and fight whatever it takes. Um uh, you just you, you just have a family just to take care of. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Nadir. And Ibrahim, how how is it for you? Um, being a man in your family, uh, as Nadir say, is a uh, is a hard thing, especially when you are the the oldest son of your family. Um, Alhamdulillah, I am the oldest son, but I I feel some responsibility of my family, like how to get water. We all of all of my brothers have to to be with each other, so we can get water to use or to drink. Uh, sometimes we we walk many kilometers just to get a clean water to drink. Uh, if we don't do that, we of course we had to to drink uh, a waste water, and that caused us many disease. And also about the food. We had many days eating just one meal in a day. Uh, and it's about uh, about one month. We had many days eating one eating one meal in a day when there is a real famine here. So even when you when you feel tired, you don't have to show your family that you are tired because of course they have the pain you have, and telling them that uh, won't help you or won't help you get uh, get rid of your pain. So being a man is, is not an easy thing in your family, especially at these times. Thank you, Ibrahim. Um, Ibrahim and Nata, uh, as much as we try to relate to how you're feeling and everything that you're uh, trying to channel through these words, it might not be enough for us as you're living that experience right now. Many of us, like even nowadays, we have never been in war. We have never actually seen the horrific things that war can do to a man. But here, I want to actually hear about what was life before. What was your aspiration? uh in gaza earlier even before the siege and, and even before gaza was actually occupied uh by the uh, israeli forces as in what were your dreams what did you actually want to do what was life like before? and what has it done actually as in my i, I post the post on the 6th of october uh, telling that or writing that Gaza is the, the the most the best place for people who are addicted to com to be comfortable, and at that time I was feeling super high. And, and the fifth of October I was in Jerusalem, in in a, in a conference for startups with the ministers and and, and actually the uh, the president of Palestine, meeting so many organizations and doing so many events in Gaza and globally. In, and doing so many things, especially to empower entrepreneurs and startups across MENA and Europe, and really doing super big jobs with Meta, Google, Amazon, and, and so on. And uh, yeah, it, it all vanished in just an instant. But also I have, uh, I've, I've created a small startup, let's say, or a small uh, agency for, for marketing. With, with with two of my friends. So we're three creating a marketing agency and start working each weekend on on and on it. Uh, we called it Circle. And then we start got five clients. And for the most stranger, uh, the strangest uh, reason for a company to shut down, uh, three out of the five clients we have got killed in the war. So we were forced to close the company, not because we ran out of cash, not because 
we don't have time for it, not because of the quality, the tools or anything. Our clients just get killed in, 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 by Israeli probation in the war. So uh, that was actually when, when I realized that I have never heard something like this, but it's, it's a strange reason for, for, for a company or it's to shut down. But yeah, this is the truth. Uh, another that must be extremely hard to actually go through. Like, even though you've had that, uh, you've had the war going on, yet you decided like, no, okay, we'll just keep going. And just to be, uh, just to be accurate here, that all happened while Gaza was still under siege. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm mostly I've been raised up and grown, start recognizing this war, and I saw Gaza and 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 under siege. And yeah, it's I'm 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 not sad about shutting down the 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 company or startup. We could build hundreds of startups as well. But I'm just very devastated by they were super. They were dreamers. They just make super perfect games and they want us to promote it in the in Saudi we were having a lot of meetings and how they were so excited and, and ambitious some of them have some website and they invested everything they have just with the dream of having a startup business and so on and they just everything just vanished in in in, in, in a second you know and, and that was yeah human life is very valuable but you could lock to death in a very different way while you are in, in some genocide. And sometimes you could lock it as a gift or something good that you, you could just escape all of this happening, all of this starvation, illness, and being in dangerous and fear all day, days and, and nights. And then at some point, you just realize death is something bad or good. Yeah. Extremely hard to go through. Uh, and I can't believe you've actually uh, still ma like still managed to uh, get through all of that. Like to see yourself having your own successful company and your clients and everything just for disappear in one second. Uh, that even brings me to one last thing, Nada. What do you hope for right now? Um, we have two sides here. Most of the of the Gazans who are in Egypt or any, like literally most of them, or any or any place in the in, in the world in the world, they just want to the war just this this shameful war just to end and then they could get back to Gaza. And my family is like this. We just want to this war to stop and then we get back to Gaza, build a tent on our house rubble. We lost our house just in an instant. They bombed it away life. And I just shared it on my Facebook as a normal post, like blowing up my my house with all of its memories and everything in it. But even that we want to build a tent on it. And I don't know why, but old Gazans, they, they, they refuse to, to be called refugees. And I'm, I'm really facing a lot of problems with the Gazans, especially youth here. I'm trying to support them finding a job and finding a solution for, for everything. And they are just stuck. We don't know, we don't need anything. We just, we are just stuck until this war to end and then we get back to the, uh, to Gaza and see what should we do. We, we are a very small community in, in lovely one. Gaza was, was it, we can't deny it, there is a siege and blockage and war from time to time, but at the same time, it was a very comfortable place and it was very, very, um, you know, warm place with beach, the, the restaurants and the experience you live inside this small uh, strip or, or, or city, it's, it's really uncomfortable. For, 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 for anything else, especially for, for Gaza. So yeah, this is for, for me and for everyone who know what to do. We just need this world to end. So we are we make sure that our beloved ones and friends are, are safe. And then we start rebuilding it back home. Well, 
inshallah you will bigger and even better than it was and it's a genuine wish for sure and i do wish it happens so soon and i was also hoping to check for the same from ibrahim ibrahim i understand that you are having some connection difficulties so you might have dropped uh when i asked the question but based on what you're feeling right now and what you've had in the past what were what were your dreams and aspirations uh, before this genocide and what do you hope for right now like tell us the story about how ibrahim was planning for the future okay before the genocide um, I choose that I choose studying diploma so I can work uh, as a young man, be independent man. Um, I graduated from my college with a GPA of uh, ninety two and first rank on my class. On my class, then I got an internship with UNRWA, uh, and after that, I I had a chance of get a contract with a local company in softwares as a software developer. Uh, also, uh, at that time, I had a dream of being a software engineer, uh, take a software engineering baccalaureate so I can be expert in my field. Uh, if, if you notice that working with the studying will get you, will help you get the theory from your college, and get the practical side from your work. So you can be an expert in your in your field. And also at that time, I had a dream of um, of starting my own software development company in Gaza. But I had that dream to make it at least after three or four years. But today, uh, during the genocide, I, I am thinking and planning for this dream of making my starting my own start uh, software development company to hire the talent developers in Gaza Strip. I had when I had when see the developer evacuate and leave Gaza so they can get a work with international companies. I know many of my friends, they are uh, the most expert in our fields, but Gaza Gaza need need those people. So I, I was thinking of how to be helpful for, for this problem. Uh, so I started thinking about how, so how can I solve these problems? It's by start a software development company to hire those experts and talent developers from Gaza Strip and connect them with international companies. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, and connect them with international companies from Gaza, work from Gaza with your family and between your family, see your family daily, uh, not go outside of Gaza and miss your family, miss your home, miss your land. That I am sure that a hard thing to feel. And during the genocide, the first thing I dream is uh, a ceasefire, immediately ceasefire, so I can survive my family, my friends, the people I love, all Gazans, all humans, civilians, we deserve to be free, we deserve to live, to have at least our minimum of human rights, to even our minimum of human rights, we see, and maybe the world see it would be a gift for us if the world give, uh, give it to us, like the food, the water, uh, being a safe, live in a peace. These are our minimum human rights we are dreaming of have uh, at any time and at any place, even in Gaza. And after after the the ceasefire, um, of course, for those who are watching us, the fact that. Ibrahim can still broadcast from Gaza. It's just something else. No electricity. So, Barely yeah. have internet. Okay. Like, and you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. So sorry for internet problem problems. We are we connecting to the internet via ASIM. And if the mobile 
just move for one centimeter, uh, you will lose the connections. And sometimes incubation make a distraction on, on the signal here, so it make hard to connect to internet. So after the ceasefire, uh, I will start my own software development company. So, so the people and the softwares, the developer, the solent developer in Gaza can stay in Gaza and work from Gaza. Then I, I will start studying a uh, software engineering baccalaureate. Uh, so I can be more, uh, get more experience in my field. Well, actually, I'm, I'm super proud of Ibrahim and everything. Uh, you, you keep listening that he wants to build the company and he is doing a very great job with a, with a lot of you and that, that really made me super happy about even inside the genocide. And actually, this is something that I think we need a psychologist just to analyze it because I feel that dreaming is the only thing that really make me happy or or, or at least in, in a good mood during war. Like I was spending not just doing disability studies or for so many stars and things and just start dreaming, planning, visualize how is the better future. Just have a good faith in, in a strong faith in God. And yeah, it's 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 the the way that really helped me just to survive all of this and spin a, a bit calm night just to start having my notes and and I keep them in, in my notes so I don't want to to uh, to delete them it's just a memory from from these severe days but yeah when you just start a uh, dream of things my passion is building business and I start and I just building an organization with structures and doing visibility study for at least 12 businesses. And that keep me keeps me so happy. And a lot of my friends just keep moving with me and start helping me with this because they know it it helped me, it helps me a lot. I don't know how or what's the exact reason, but yeah, the dreaming and having faith in God is one of the best practices I've been doing in the world. Thank you, Nada, for sharing that Thanks. because also a quick personal story. So, you know, obviously my parents are from, I, I said this, from Tormos Ayer, the Falarbiya, uh, but I, I was born in Puerto Rico. So I grew up in the diaspora and, but I've always been, you know, we traveled a lot to Palestine. So I'm very familiar with occupied Palestine, been to El Quds and, you know, all, all of Palestine except Gaza. I always wanted to go, but they're like, you can't go. They're not going to let you through um, just because... I've always had just so much respect and admiration for Palestinians living in Gaza, just the resilience, just incredible people. Um, and, but you know, when this genocide started, I always said like, I, I've been dedicating 150% of my time just trying to free Palestine, that's what I say. And, but when I saw, when I see people like you, Ibrahim, you, Nadir, all the incredible people, I'm not like getting goosebumps right now, but all the incredible Palestinians in Gaza, I tell people that I started this whole thing trying to free Palestine, but Palestine freed me from myself. I have never felt more free than after I, I've been activated in such a different way because of the people of Gaza, because of everything both of you are saying, right? You talked about like building a tent where your home used to be. I mean, that's incredible. Just wanting to stay. And then Ibrahim, just the love that you have for your people, talking about how you're, you want to stay in Gaza, but then work, you know, with international companies. And you said other beautiful things about like human rights and how, of course, we Palestinians deserve human rights, just like we deserve water, the air that we breathe in, food, right? Why is it that we historically for over 75 years have been deprived of just basic decency in human rights. It is unbelievable. And so, which actually leads me to my next question and both of you touched on it. And that is, you know, you talk about religion, you know, that, you know, your faith. And I, and I do believe that in Amal, right? Hope. So Deen wal Amal and how that's, that's helping you cope. So maybe Ibrahim, you can, and then of course, you know, you'll have an opportunity to elaborate on that, but what, like when you reflect on your day-to-day, -day, Ibrahim, when you get up in the morning, what is it that, that kind of keeps you going? How do you cope? How do you, how do you, 
endure just the daily existence of being in a genocide? Sometimes when, when I wake up, to be honest, I, I give up many times, but we don't have another choice. To live, you have to fight. To get your minimum human rights, you have to speak up. You have to, to tell the world about what's going on here in Gaza. To, to stay alive, to, to make anything you want, you have to wake up, do your things, uh, trying to find food, water. Because if you, if you don't do that, you, you want to stay alive. Um, I also sometimes when, even during the genocide, uh, I start, I, I pack to work on app work. Uh, before the genocide by one day, I got a contract with international company on app work. And in, in the night of 6 October and 7 October, uh, woke up in the sounds of bombing. Uh, I tried as much as I can to work with them, but internet problems, then the cut of electricity, no electricity. So I, I, I couldn't have the chance to work with them. They understand my situation. But Alhamdulillah, uh, also after, before two or three months, I try to back to work on app work as a freelancer. And I got 100% of job success. Also, I got a top-rated badge. Top-rated badge means that you are one of the 10% freelancer in app work. Uh, what I, this, I do this for two things. First thing, you, you need to work so you can stay alive to buy food, water, or anything you need here in Gaza, or even try evacuating. Second thing, I, I want the whole world to show that even during these difficult times, we we are ready to work. We we have the faith. We are hoping this genocide to be over, to stop. Also, we are trying that the genocide won't affect in our work. I know it was hard for me and it's still hard for me to connect to internet, uh, charge my laptop so I can uh, work or this, this, these difficult things. But I, I want to tell the world, even during difficult times, Palestinians, Gazans specifically, uh, deserve uh, all of our human rights. Uh, we, we are trying as much as I can to tell the world that we are exist. Even if you are suffering, we can work. We, we won't give up. The occupation try all of things they, they do to, to make us give up, but we won't give up. We are on this land. We are on this this Gaza. Even if they still incubated us, we we are trying as much as they can to to not give up. Thank you, Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. um, one thing actually kind of caught my attention, and I'm not even sure how to describe it, but is everyone in Gaza actually an entrepreneur? or has that will to just keep going regardless of whatever happens? Um, you know, Yazan, uh, I, I could remember a situation happened with, with my friend. I was super, after my house uh, was destroyed and uh, we saw the British at, at, at the second day, I was super sad. I really was super sad and couldn't even stay with my family because everyone was, was trying and really devastated. And then I went to them and told them, I was, I'm done. I couldn't do anything more. I want to give up. To me, okay, what should we do? If you want to give up, you don't have a choice. You don't have like, okay, give up. What should you do? There is nothing you can do. You don't have any option. Just keep doing and, and, and fighting. And, and that was comes from several things. One of them, because Gazans, we are very stubborn. We are so dedicated. You can't change our mind easily. The second thing is that we used to that. We used to just to fight to find the job opportunity. We used to fight for our land, for our identity, for fighting all of these lies and propaganda that they are spreading in the media. And that we went super crazy when we saw anything on 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 media. And that's why we are witnessing witnessing it with with our eyes. And then 
you just open the media and see a totally different story and that really very frustrating and uh, yeah we, we even in the normal days the normal days uh, normal days for us is when the season blockage happened we wish that we could retain to those days and now everything was com is just completely erased but yeah we used to just fight and uh, seeking for each and sing and, and, and every single opportunity that we could try to get now that you touched on something so i'm a part of a collective called unmute humanity and this idea sort of um got generated i should say during the genocide because i couldn't believe it and i'm not in any way comparing myself to what you've endured but I, like i can't even imagine what you and ibrahim have endured because the, the like i and i talked about it in other webcasts the physical pain that I would feel waking up like it really it really affected me from a physical mental health standpoint and so and what made it even worse was exactly what you said and that is seeing the corporate media spin the dehumanization of Palestinians the use of like passive language to describe what the Israeli occupation forces are doing to Palestinians the minima the, the, the minimizing that was done of our debt, the doubting of our debt, the doubting of the forced starvation and everything else, all the other horrors, right? That we kind of touched upon today. So that, I, I, you can touch on that, Yuna Ibrahim, just about the corporate media piece, because how did that make you feel? When you, you know what you're enduring and you see corporate media and the spin, and just to let you know at Unmute, we're combating that. So we're constantly trying to hold corporate media accountable for its coverage of what's happening in occupied Palestine, what's happening in Gaza. But how does that make you feel when you know what you've endured, you know what you're seeing, and then you see the corporate media spin? I don't know who would like to take that on first, Nadir or Ibrahim. Um, I could go. Uh, it's it's really fat and super, super painful. Like they are doing a very bad propaganda and even for situations that I witness in, in, in my eyes, like we have a near house, uh, a near uh, in school beside our the warehouse we were uh, sleeping in, in, in Rafa and they're just targeting that school. Um, in the media, in the Israeli media, they told us uh, it was a military base and uh, everything for and uh, that was military uh, groups there in the, in the school or what military? It it was full of displaced people from the northern part of Gaza, and I was there every day, uh, just filling out our bottles of water and uh, having some supplements from from there. I was literally every and was I was charging my my laptop and phone from there, solar panels there, and then so many people died around, literally around forty five something like this. All of them are displaced people and. I, I really have very bad videos on my phone on, on that. How are little kids, grandmothers, they keep getting them out from the, the bodies out of the rubble, uh, I think three or four days because there is no equipment just to, to pull them out. And then you just claim they are a military base and everyone justify that for you for killing 45 people, innocent people, kids, and I've, I've been wasting that in, in, in my life and been carrying some bodies under that trouble. And that case, repeating in everything, every single thing in, 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 in the world, how the world is, is so blind in this. I don't know how, and I'm really curious to know how you are seeing this in, in the wrong way, but how you see Palestinians are the, 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 the wrong side and how you could justify all of this killing 40,000 Palestinian people killing. And I'm, I'm, I really don't know how to just don't say the number because each one have a soul and dream and a family and beloved one. Like each one means everything for, for, for someone else. Um, I know like I counted them 21 from my close friends have lost their entire family and now they are alone. I don't know how, what, what, I've never talked to any one of them because I don't know what to do. Uh, what this, like, I don't know what to say. If someone just lost 
a beloved one, his father or his mother, his, his brother or sister. Um, you could say, Hoss, you just pray for them and for, for him or, or her. But I have a friend who lost 42 one of them from there, from his family. He's alone. His father, his mother, his sisters and their children, his brothers and their children, their uncles and their brothers and sisters. So it's a, it's something insane. I have another one who lost in Khanyuz, he lost 21 from his, his family and he's also alone. And he told me, I don't know what to do. I literally, my father was, was leading the family and he was, I was suggesting them, or I was suggesting, but he was like, just leading us in every, everything. And now I'm super lost. I don't know what to do. I'm alone in this life. I don't know. Build our life again. Go to Rafa or go to Khanyuz. I just, I don't have anyone to, to just speak with. And um, I really don't know when he's do this, this war or this genocide stops. There's a lot of missing and people will start realizing and for me also, I, I couldn't realize what is happening until three months after after I, I get out of, of Gaza. I skipped that. It's really very hard. Just and I, I really realized that when I and I have a close Italian friend who I met him here in Cairo, he asked me, Now how many times have you have been close to death? And it was my first time just to see that flashbacks when I saw in in in, in movies. It's more than a hundred times, not just for me. I was in with, with my families and I was with my friends. There are so many situations that I would, it's just from three, five seconds, just to five minutes, just I was super close to this with, with, with me and my family. And one, one of the situations that um, in Rafa, I was with my family going to go to my uncle tent because we really missed him so much when he just, just to talk, even it's changed, it's dangerous, but just we need to see someone we we know and just we could share how this war crushed us, but just sharing anything with them. And then in our way back, someone stopped us from our neighbors just to make sure we are okay. And how are you? We miss you. Where are you living now? Do you need anything? It's just like a one or two minute uh, chat, just a quick check. And then while we are talking with him at the end of the road it a, a very huge explosion happened where if he didn't stop us we would be at that place at the same time and when we were there it's it's literally my first time time to see a sea of blood all the street was blood 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 so many people were killed injured i don't know it's like a lot of smoke and at least three or five hundred people are laying down the street with sinking them, but I don't know what to do with them, just being amazed and how God saved us in, in, in this moment. And it happened also for me. I was in a place with my friends at the same time we were in Khanyunis. We left it after five minutes. They target all of this place and so many of our neighbors were 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 killed. And I just I was super lucky. In, just not this or that, just more than a hundred times. And then you start realizing that how, how crazy all of this happened. I was before I was I was being sad in, in very silly things. I was being sad because my laptop is, is not a Mac Pro, it was Mac Air, so I need a really new one. I was really sad of not achieving a lot of work, being stressed with work, uh, some Turkish series or movies. It's it's been crazy how things are are are, are changed and how, yeah, you could see the life in in a very, uh, in a very like from from a very different perspective, and uh, yeah, that that teaches you a lot. I. There are no words in other, just incredible. Wow. Ibrahim, I don't know if you have any follow-up to that in terms of just, you know, touching on what Nadir talked about in terms of when, what you're experiencing and then what you see the world is saying, how that, what that experience is like for you. 
Um, I just want to add something to what Nader says. Uh, just being late for five seconds or even one or two seconds could save your life from death, could save your life from being killed and be the birds and no one could know your birth, know your artistry. And for what the world see and what we are witnessing here in Gaza, uh, sometimes I thinking when, when the people see the news, they don't have the full idea of what's going on in Gaza. You just see that the Israeli occupation bomb a home or a street or even a land in Gaza. But you don't know the details. The media won't show you all the details, all people's feelings around this place or in the place. And also, one idea I believe in is that Israel tell you but Palestine and Gaza show you. I I had many, many friends. They don't have a clear idea about how this genocide started or what's going on here in Gaza. They say because Israel promote a, a fake news. They I just lost the button. But I hope to be in a couple of seconds. Yay. Are you? Yes, we hear you. Okay, sorry, interest of yours. So I was saying that uh, when Israel is removed for the breaking news about what's going on on 7 October or at any days of this genocide, they won't show you an evidence for what they are saying. They they just want the whole world to take a, a false idea about Gaza and what's going on here in Gaza. But in Gaza, we we just show you what Israel did for us, for civilians, young women, even children. So that's a hard a hard thing to, to understand or to believe in it. So I don't know what else to say. Yeah, I just want to add something here is that all of this media talking about Gaza is that um, uh, there, there are very dirty places where the, the Israeli soldiers, when they come, they find a, a, a flesh-eating bacteria who eat them and stray dogs who, who attack them and that, trying to focus this propaganda that they are this dirty place where they are all of them are, are terrorists and they just try to save some li little puppies and cats. Well, it's very shown that they are bringing them from them because we don't have that kind of dogs or cats in, in, in Gaza where, where they are filming. But this propaganda is, is, is super, super, super crazy. And I don't know how people could do that, actually, even if, if I'm a Zionist, even if I hate Palestinians so much. But at least, like, I can't, like... Let a, a, a military dog attack a, a grandmother as a scene in, in the video and just being so, I don't know, it's, it's more than a monster. I think the monster just go and eat you directly. And they are more than, they, they are more awful than, 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 than a monster. And, and this is really for, for creating. Before the war, the war happened in October, in, in late May, we had a war for, for several days where Israeli got a, attacked Gaza and killed a lot of people, but it, it didn't get that mean, that attention in, in media. But it's like four four months before 7th of October, they were attacking us, they were killing a lot of people from from, from, from airstrikes for I think three or four, three days or, or a week. I don't think we we got three weeks, uh, three months or five months maximum without the war. And this happening started from 20, as I, as far as I recognize, I've been displaced like thousand times. I've been displaced in 2007. In 2014, I got my home totally destroyed and we rebuilt it again. And we rebuilt another house 
and then both of them were destroyed in, in, in this war. So it's not just started from the October 7th, it started from even earlier than 20, uh, 1948. Gazans are humans and we have the right just to resist in our, 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 land, our land free. And I'm really sad that these days we are taking, talking about getting Gaza back, getting the uh, 1967, uh borders back it's not the way that any of the palestinians or at any of the palestinians are thinking about this it's more of all the palestinians will be free we don't care about the international oh, yeah. law we don't care about the propaganda we don't care about anything and i got this conversation with many people that yeah because there are a lot of a lot of israelis who are who were born in in, in israel right now and uh where should they go i don't care where should they go they just go where from where their ancestors or their fathers came from because yeah I, 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 we need our, our land back and i don't know how to describe it or how to to explain that but it's just something that all palestinians agree on and something that having uh that Two state solution. I don't think it's it's feasible for us or for them, because we do believe it's all our land and it is our land, and they do believe that it's a Jewish country, and Jewish state. They they believe that it's from the Nile. Their country is from the Nile River to the uh, to the to the uh, to Iraq. So they just believe in this. And I, I, when I went to uh, when I went to Jerusalem, to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, I was seeing that tourist guides, the, the brochures that showing Al-Aqsa with, that, with their temple is not Al-Aqsa Mosque, where they distribute that into the... Uh, so th that, I too, I had like, way of thinking is we couldn't live together. And even if that we have a, a, an armless country, it's impossible. They, they won't leave us alone, you know, and we are seeing that in the West Bank. There is no Hamas in the West Bank. They are just a group of boys who are defending their, their camps and their story, their homes, and they, they couldn't leave them alone. Yeah. I just want to add to what you just said. You know, pre the genocide, you know, a lot of us were like, well, two state, maybe it's feasible. I never really completely was sold on the two state idea, but I'll tell you one thing. After this genocide, no, one state one state only and we stand firm and steadfast in our belief in one state and it will be called palestine because what happened in gaza and what's happening in the west bank you guys have seen there's the increasing expansion of settlements they just approved 5300 home uh, settler homes in the west bank illegal homes um they're not going to leave us alone they're not going to stop until we are completely erased from Palestine. And so this is why, because of this, one state and one state only. And I think, again, the genocide, the the, the, the global, I mean, even though the, we have the people's hearts, right, you see the activation in the world that has been support of Palestinians, but looking at global governments, they do not have our best interest at heart. They have allowed this genocide to go on and on and on unchecked. There are no red lines. So at this point, we will continue to resist. We will continue to fight. We will continue to advocate for a pre-Palestine. I'm with you, one state and one state only. Melanie just added something here that could an end to apartheid, one people, one state be something to work towards. I mean, final comments from, from Nadir. I think we lost Ibrahim, everyone. I did message him and I'm unable to get a hold of him. He's having a lot of problems. The internet, but he replied with by Brahim. Actually, it was very, very difficult to get an internet or, or uh, charging your phone in, in, in Gaza. I was walking kilometers just to change to, to, to charge my phone, it was very hard. And now he's doing this. I it's 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 very amazing for me. It is incredible, Ibrahim. I know you're back on. Any last words from you? Anything that you would like? people to know about the strength, resilience of the people in Gaza, just any anything at all that you want to leave us with. And thank you for coming back. 
Um, um, if I need the whole world to know what we need uh, immediately, it is fair. Uh, we need our minimum for human rights. We need all of our human rights, not just the minimum. Um, the most important thing that we need this genocide to stop. We need an immediate ceasefire. Yes, absolutely. Immediate ceasefire. Any anything for for you, Nadir? Yeah, I just want to to assure that that propaganda is totally false, and what is happening in, in inside the world, the war and the this genocidal war in Gaza is way more disgusting than what we could see in, in, in the media. And it's really not about killing people, not about only telling lies and what not about only occupying land, but also there are really terrified people in case our 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 day in Gaza who are who couldn't find a shelter, who couldn't find maybe it's 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 an easy word just to tell. We couldn't find a food or shelter, but the most the scariest thing that I feel when I was in Rafah or in, in the old uh, war is that when I stand up in 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 a, in, in, in Rafah in Al Auda Square code is very common for everyone in Gaza knows it now because they were there. There is no food. And I was I was I was crying. I couldn't hold my tears. There is no food. My family is waiting for me. I don't know why it was very terrifying that you couldn't find a food maybe because it's an ugly way to die or a slow painful die or something i don't know actually but it was very painful that you feel there is no food and if you start thinking about it it's very very very, very painful that you could find a food i've been i got poisoned at least 12 times from water especially and there is no treatment. And, uh, that was the, the most painful thing that happened ever to me. I got a bad fever, even my name is turned to, to blue and there is no treatment. You just hold your stomach and try not to shout because there are a hundred people sleeping beside you in that warehouse. And uh, yeah, it's just that it's not only what you we are seeing in, in, in media, each one of the 40,000, and I hope it's stop there. I hope it's only 40,000 40, people. Um, each one have a story, have a dreams. For me, I'm not sure I'm how to be sad on them because I lost a lot of neighbors, friends, relatives, university teachers, university professors, school teachers. People I have spent very lovely time with. Yesterday, just my one one of my close friends just died with his entire family. No one from his family still alive. And the day before, there is a journalist who I'm working with. Was, oh, he, he was filming our uh, events for entrepreneurship in Gaza. And he was killed. I don't know how to feel sad about more than a thousand people. It's 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 really insane. And uh, yeah. It's more of how we could show the, that personal aspect or that personal perspective of each one of their story. I'm, I'm, and I'm really supporting on, on, on that. It's not just the numbers. It's just every one of them has, has a story and has dreams and has, he was everyone else. So ev everything for someone else. I mean. So uh, yeah, just need this war to end and, just stop these numbers. This really, it's it's not numbers. Stop these awful things that are that are happening. And the way the war just start, we can even realize like, come on, people, can they recognize that? Just be awake and just see. Like you have a, a, a thousand millions of reels stories from from everyone in, in, in that world. We couldn't, all, not all of them, them could be liars, you know? And I got a friend, I was with them in, in, in a day, and then the second day he was killed, he was working in the Norwa facility inside the, the, the UN headquarters in Rafah, he was killed there. I'm, I'm not sure how they are 
targeting a UN facility in like directly, but another one who was injured. This is like, this is not a criminal war. This is more of really the international war breaking the international war completely and no one is, is, is talking. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to solve it, but we need to stay together and we need just to let that war know and at some point has, even if they don't want to know is their choice of choosing that from the side of the history but we still need to fight it's it's not a privilege it's not something slightly brief it's it's more of our lives our lands um for my parents they spent they are a normal governmental uh, employees and they spent 28 out one sex they are they spent 28 years of their uh working career just having money to build that house and now it's all vanished and my mother gold is we 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 sold it for uh so we could escape the, the genocide and now it's more of all of their dreams and all of their efforts and everything they dream of they just vanish in, in, in one second and it's more of some crazy moments and think that in media it could look bad or it could look uh, small I mean or something not that much but imagine all of your efforts and went for 28 for, for the whole of your life just vanishing in, in one second with all of your memories and all of your small belongings and everything just disappearing in one second and this is not nothing compared to losing an entire family or even one member of your family or even got ill without a treatment and, and, and so on. So yeah, this is my last word that we need a ceasefire. We would need to recognize everything happening in Gaza and support ending, not just ending this genocide and also ending this incubation for the whole land and finding a place for the Zionist in the uh, Arizona desert to have fun there. And it's, close to their beloved America. Thank you, Nadia, for the perfect picture, actually. All those hopes and dreams where we're standing with you, hopefully, inshallah, they'll come true. Uh, not sure, but I think Ibrahim has dropped. I think, let him, I'd like to see maybe if he'll come back again. Just to see if there's any final, final, final words. Thank you, Nadir, for everything you said. Thank you. There are no words, you know. So I think what has stayed with me. It's really hard that you could describe everything and you could even, even with the pictures. But it's like, it's very painful moments when I've been working so much in, in, in not just with the bombing, and you just woke up. And then you start running in the street. It happened with me like 50 times at least. You just, you couldn't sleep well. And if you sleep for, for, for some minutes or hours, then an ex, a, a very near explosion happened. People start shouting in the street, evacuate, evacuate. And then you start running. You are still sleeping. You know what, what, what to do. At, at some point I was super sick. And then I started running with, with the fastest thing I can. And then I, I slept in the street until the dawn is coming because I was very sick and couldn't stand. So, yeah. Wow. It's Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. Really. Thank you, Nadia, for everything that you've shown us and talked about. So at the end, you are our, our eyes out there. And we do hope that you stay safe all the time. And the same thing goes for Ibrahim. I really wish you'll be able to uh, Tell us uh, some of the last things that you would like to share. Like, um, you have the stage to yourself. What would you like to tell the world? What would you like them to hear? Uh, I also want to say that uh, when I talk about I back to the war, uh, I I walk about two or three hours so I can reach that place. Uh, where they provide the freelancers for an internet and uh, electricity from solar panel. Um, 
Also, I want the whole world to know that we we are still dying here. As another say, uh, our friend Saad in Dukh, he's a journalism, journalism in Gaza, in the north. Uh, the occupation killed uh, his family. Uh, he was one of the best uh, <clears throat> of the best people in Gaza, dreaming. Uh, he has uh, his, his, he has his he has his uh, his own uh, production company. Uh, when I uh, was at my college, I was the organizer of the prize uh, in my college, and we we make a a closing ceremony. Uh, and Sadi was one of our sponsors. I remember when he talked about his dreams to, to his friends. I I remember many friends in Gaza. Uh, the occupation killed them. They they were have a dreams for, for our community in Gaza. Be helpful. And sadly the, the occupation killed many of those people, of those you know, people in Gaza. They were civilians. Um, also, I want to say that we, the families still in Gaza, we people in Gaza and we in Gaza, uh, try hard, try hardest uh, for our if. Oh, thank you for him. Let's we'll do a couple of seconds just. Yeah. Ibrahim. Um, sorry. Uh, again, it's internet problems. Can you hear me good now? Yes, it's probably clear. Um, also, also, I want to say about uh, our pain. For me, personality, uh, Ibrahim, uh, I I feel that I reach the the hardest level of of this trauma. Uh, before about. Two months, I start see seeing lights not exist. I ask many doctors. Many of them say to me that this is because of the trauma you you are facing in Gaza because of your situation. Uh, I don't know how to heal myself, uh, and don't know how to to at least be better. Yes, Brian, you're with us again. Again, I am so sorry for internet problems. Uh, I was telling you that I I reached the hardest level of the room I face. I start seeing lights not exist, and uh, I had sometimes that I I felt so scared. Uh, when seeing a light, you may think it is from a sniper or from uh, their plans uh, or their quadcopters. Uh, so it makes you feel so scared when you see the, these lights even and specifically at night. So I, I just hope this is going to decide to be over. Uh, to stop as soon as possible, to to live in in a safe place, in a peace, and also, uh, I want to tell you a story. Uh, when I was volunteering here with honor filters as a data entry, uh, I I I saw a girl right wrote that, uh, and she says that uh, we are sorry for for our school for what we are facing and what we are seeing from our school i i imagined and i feel that of course she mean that uh, facing and challenging how to get food or even leave you yes the you over that Uh, okay, uh, I was I was telling you about the story. 
uh, when I was volunteering in, uh, in UNRWA shelter in Gaza here in my camp as a data entry volunteer, I saw a girl write, wrote uh, that she, 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 she was uh, very sorry for, for her school, for what they are facing and it's challenging and for what they uh, get a bad uh, things from their school. I just imagine and feel that those children, uh, they, they don't deserve to get this chance. Leave your home and go to the school that you, you must study it not to get it as a shelter. Uh, and of course, they are challenging, many challenges. Like just even the simple, the simple thing when you want to go to the bathroom, you may don't find water. You of course you will find many people, uh, stand and waiting, uh, and when when those people at at the shelters waiting for the food or water, as many people in Gaza, so it's it's a terrible thing that to live in in the place you you were uh, should to study in it not to get it as a shelter. And I hope this genocide to be over just as soon as possible to get all of our human rights, not just the uh, I hope for a ceasefire as soon as possible. I hope to see Palestine free, all of Palestine, not just Gaza, the whole Palestine. Sometimes when, when I thinking that my land, uh, our citizen Palestine, there is just between me and my city just one kilometer and feel so painful that I, I can't go to my city because of this occupation. Before a, a few weeks, I reached to, to the end point in the middle area of Gaza where you can see the Nitzarim. Uh, the occupation is there, of course. Uh, just seeing the Gaza city in front of your eyes and Gaza, the Gaza Sea and you can't go there. I live my whole life there, studying, working with my friends, uh, with my family, just seeing your city in front of your eyes, and you can't go there. It's such a painful thing and feeling to, to witness all of this. Um, that's just part of the struggle. Um every Gaza has to go through. And Ibrahim is one of the lucky, like the lucky people who can have access to internet, to electricity, even to a roof top of their heads. Yeah, I mean, good point is then what people don't realize is that there's still um, these ongoing communication blackouts that are happening. People, it's 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 become old news, but it's still happening. People have creative ways of accessing electricity, but electricity is not on for us. Um, I, right, Nadir? Yeah, for, for the context, uh, there is no electricity at, at all since the, I mean, early October. Exactly. They, but also for, for internet, uh, they keep uh, they keep targeting the towers of the, the, the signals, for whether for telecommunication or the, uh, the internet, but uh, Gazans find a way of having an ESIM connected to the Israeli uh, telecommunication towers who are in the in the settlements beside Gaza, but they detect each that each each of that and then they start uh, blocking those those signals. So I'm, I'm think this is what happening with Israel and this is what also happened with me. You just have few minutes just to check the the news before they block the. Uh, the, the, the signals and that was the main way that you could have internet and there are some ways where you could have internet but they block it uh, immediately then you don't it's not very reliable thank you Ned. yeah that's what I thought the, the electricity is not back they just it's solar panel correct there are a lot of a lot of we are super lucky that it before uh, before 7th of October, Gaza uh, were, had a, a schedule for, for power cuts. 
where we have eight hour on and eight hour off or 12 hour off and uh, six hours uh, on, which is managed by as rate of the shortage of the fuel and, and everything. And then they built um, for the universities, there are some development organizations who built solar panels for the uh, schools, schools, hospitals, and uh, the international organizations, the headquarters of the international organizations, they made that for, for them. So when the war happened, you see people who sheltered the school and the hospitals like Shifa or Nasser because there is an electricity there and they assume that it's relatively safe where Israel just came and attacked them first, whether the schools or the universities. Yesterday, at least, Two schools were, were just one one in the morning and uh, one this this day morning and one yesterday full of displaced people. I don't know I couldn't know why the war is ignoring this. That's just it's more than crazy. Just targeting people who are full of displaced people in the middle of Maghazi or Nusrat camp, which is a camp already of people who were displaced before by Israel in for in, in nineteen forty eight. And it's like, yeah, it's like more f f a crazy thing. And it's, and I really want to promote more of the stories and what's happening in Bieber. And then I, I, I really support in, in, in that effort. And for me personally, I lost my grandmother. She was sick in, in the war in uh, Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus, and we couldn't find an oxygen for her. She, she had some issues in, in the lung and then she died. She passed away. Because there is in, in 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 the middle of the world, there is no treatment for her, and well, that was a very difficult moment for my mother because she's her only daughter, and we experienced a very tough time in in, in this and uh, and that happened to a lot of me because I uh my my brother uh, Karim he's working he's he's he was studying in Al Azhar University. Uh, medicine in the fourth year and he started volunteering in Las Rose and I was with him just to make sure anything bad happened to him and then you see how in hospitals terrifying and horrible things are happening us so I've seen a lot of really bad moments it's my first time just to find a beheaded one and just analyze he's my uh, friend's father uh, that was actually made me a trauma and couldn't sleep for, for several days of seeing that head beside a body. Uh, and then I just realized he's someone I know. And yeah, like for example, there is uh, a man with his wife carrying on his their their uh, son. And he, he has a cat in the... Uh, what is cool in his back? So he, he he was super paralyzed and they were super crying because he was playing karate and some self-defense uh, games. And they were shouting and just super shocked with that uh, their son was unable and paralyzed in, in his lower body parts. And yeah, super, a lot of many other situations. Like I found two little girls who were super cold and they were injured, but not that much. And I told their grandmother, she was with them. They are super cool. Like go, let them go to their home or where are their parents and do something for them. They are suffering. She told me they just attacked the home. And I, I don't know where is the other. All of them are died. The, the home destroyed. So we just came to the hospital. I couldn't find just two of them. And the others are whether in the... Uh, they are all dead, basically. So I was speechless. What should I, uh, I tell her? There's no place for her to go. She has two of her uh, daughters, and it's 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 very hard. And there's a lot of actually there is a lot of stories for each one and, and everyone. I'm I feel super lucky that I didn't lose many of my family members who are my close family members and relatives. But there are a lot of people out there. I don't, I don't know what I, I've read a number before of how many orphans who are in Gaza right now, something 70,000 or 100,000, I think something like this. But it's like it's more of a something that we could 
we could imagine or, or say, I don't know how this people will, will live even after the war. It's something very, very crazy, actually. It's beyond, and it just sort of reaffirms that what we're seeing is a microcosm of the, the of the suffering and the horror that people are actually enduring, you know, which is what makes everything to me more unjust and infuriating, the lack of like real coverage of what's happening in Gaza right now. Exactly. And they are targeting journalists. Actually, uh, I've read that it's the most killing war for journalists in, in, in the history of the of, of humanity. It's the most war that there are journalists who were killed and specifically target. And it was very obvious they were targeting their cars, their homes, everything. Anyone who's holding a camera or and, and press sign, he's 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 a target. And 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 uh, at that time we were where we were in Rafah. It was very dangerous just to walk beside the journalist. No one could uh, have, like have a journalist who's sleeping or sheltering in his house. And the school just let them like ask them to to go out of the school because they are dangerous. While they did international law, law should protect them, but they were targeting them, them specifically, whether as individuals or their cars or their homes or any place they are sheltering, which is beyond what explain it now. But putting everything aside, even those trying to get the truth out would be targeted, which is systematically done. Um, I'm not up to date on the number of uh, reporters and journalists that have died already or been killed in Gaza, but I do believe that that exceed, exceeded about over 100 or 200 uh, journalists already. Yeah. And it's the most war, it's the most killing, deadly war for journalists in the world. Yeah. yeah. And this is the part, like we owe so much to these journalists for literally risking their lives. I mean, people forget that these journalists are also going through all the suffering. Do you know what I mean? That everyone else is going through. And in addition to that, they're putting their lives on the line, putting themselves out there and recording this genocide. And the Israeli occupation forces deliberately, because they don't want the truth to go out. You would be amazed how many people now, by the way, Nadir, you know, living here in the United States, same thing for you as and now have become pro-Palestine that I had no idea due to these journalists. And not only through formal journalists, but just through Palestinians in Gaza who have now have followings, who have been showing us what's happened. If it wasn't, for social media. And this is even with the intense censorship that we have via Meta and social media. Cause they're they 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 shadow ban, you know, they they remove posts whenever we, I mean, it happens to me all the time, happens to a lot of people all the time. But even with that, the truth is coming out. But like we said, it's microcosms of what's actually happening, right? But if it weren't right. for those, where would we be? Exactly. And and happens even before war. I just want to mention that this this happened even before October 7th. Whenever you you, you mention anything about Palestine, it's just not lower the reach. Even if, if I if I post a story and I tested that myself, if I post several stories with songs and views, and then some a story for Palestine, just Palestine, like having a normal day in Gaza or Palestine, something like this. The story it couldn't download in, in, in anyone uh then and they, they they want to try at least from at least eight times and close and open the story so they could see that specific story. But the other thing is, is working very close. And I tried it several times with several ones. It's very, very, very case because I was very curious why it's the, the, the numbers of views for all the stories. It's uh with it, it's a high number. But even for this story, it's a very low number. But even the one after it, it's a high. How they could pass it? Then I tried this, and then uh, I I I realized that they 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 make it very heavy to download, 
or undownloadable. So you could just pass it and go to the to the other to the next code. I and just experienced that. I, I know what you mean. It's weird, yeah. right? Like the first story will have few views and your second story will have more views. I, yes, it's censorship. This exactly. is a systematic, deliberate. I mean, I'm telling you one day, I think all Palestinians need to do a class action lawsuit against Meta and all these techno fascists who are literally a part of the arsenal of genocide uh, by US imperialism and by the Israeli occupation forces, because I've never seen this level of censorship when it comes to any other issue in the world. But exactly. We are very small land with a very, very small view. I don't know why they are focusing on that. But then uh, when I was in Egypt, I was watching several movies. And then I just realized how this, it's very repetitive scenario where that people where they have guns and technology and support, they just get out to indigenous, and indigenous people and then start killing them and controlling them and doing very bad stuff. It happens in almost all Hollywood movies. I don't know if they are replicating that on us or, or, or something like this. And even if, if you just open and repair the movie, you will find that pigs with the technology and by that big machine and guns and they start occupying their island. If you want Hunger Games, Island, uh, The Maze Runners, Robin Hood, and any, any movie, any Hollywood movie, you will find the same scenario where people with technology, power, and then they come to control that traditional people and indigenous people in that in their in their place and controlling them. And it's in all scenarios, the, the, the traditional people and the indigenous people win at the end. So I don't know why people they 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 believe in all these movies and when it starts reality, they just want to close their eyes and look away. You know? So just it's it's really something if you notice it, it's like typically the same. Absolutely. Yeah, that colonial savior sort of like, we're going to go in and we're going to save the indigenous people from themselves, right? It's the same story. Exactly. It's happening in, in reality right now. Yeah. We know the end. All of us know the end. All yep. of us know Inshallah. Free Palestine from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Ibrahim, anything for you before we close out? Thank you so much for coming back. Mm -hmm, thank you. And sorry again for the interruptions. We are the one who are sorry, Allah, brother. We ain't Allah in other. Ibrahim, anything for you before we close out? Mm -hmm. At all? No, thank you. And I just want to say, like, thank you for your patience. In spite of all the connections, the fact that you kept trying to, you know, connect back into this webcast, just so honored. Thank you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and your family and you too, Nadir, protect all of Ahl Ghazal, inshallah. Thank you, Fatim. Uh, thank you, Nadir, again. Thank you, Ibrahim, Fatima, Melanie. The background, just making sure we're <laughs> we're all good out there. Uh, so yeah, again, uh, this was our sixth webcast, uh, surviving the genocide in and outside of Gaza. And again, voice of Palestine, we're doing our best to ensure that uh, with all of that media bias out there, we're bringing you the most sincere and honest uh, voices from Palestine, so that. We would know that they're just not numbers that we hear about all the time on news uh, or in the media or anywhere. They're people and they have a voice and they must be. So thank you and thank you for watching. So looking forward to seeing you on our next webcast. Thank you all.